So let's get ready to go into the Word. Um, we're going to go in the Word this morning. Grab your Bibles. This goes with you. Grab your Bibles. Let's, um, Genesis chapter 3. We're going to pick up um, just a brief word I believe the Lord has in store for us to share with our men this morning. Next week, uh, Pastor Katani and I are going to continue the teaching that we have been doing so we can just continue to move forth and hear from God. But I just wanted to share from this story to our men this morning to prayerfully encourage us to just continue on and be who God would have us to be. So if you're in Genesis chapter 3, let's look to God for a word of prayer. Then we're going to pray and then we're going to talk through the message this morning that the good Lord may move and have his way in our midst. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Lord, you're a wonderful God. You are a gracious God. You are a mighty God. You are a phenomenal God. So we thank you for our women. We don't take that lightly. But even though we take today to celebrate fathers, we thank you for dads. We thank you for fathers. We thank you for men in general, Lord. So as we go to the word, we're praying that you would just speak through us, speak afresh as you did. Um, we don't want to rely on this morning's anointing, but we just want a fresh word from you, God, because you want to be encouraged to be who you would have us to be. So we love you in spite of all the technical difficulties, all is well. We just go forth to give you praise, to give you honor, and to give you glory, Lord. So we bless your holy name. Be glorified. I'm praying that something would be said that would encourage a man, God, to just stop the hiding and just come forth and be the person you've created them to be. So we give you praise, honor, and glory. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Hey, if you're sitting next to a uh, male figure or a man, I need you to repeat out of me. Say, gentlemen, gentlemen. Stop, hiding. stop hiding. God cares for you. Yeah, come on, turn next man. Say, you say it like you mean it. Say, gentlemen, gentlemen. Stop, hiding. stop hiding. God cares for you. Cares. Amen. I want to talk about that this morning. Um, by way of introduction, I think it's important that we all know and understand that the goal of the enemy is to destroy God's plan for the family. That's just his bottom line, his, his objective, his goal, his, his whatever he's trying to do is to really stop God's plan for the family or destroy God's plan for the family. And you'll need to hear this morning, he will stop at nothing short until he accomplishes that goal. I mean, if he has to work through whatever vehicle, and we, talk, we used the term vehicle a couple of weeks ago when we described the serpent. Whatever mechanism, whatever vehicle he needs to use to accomplish his work, he will do that. And we need to be cognizant of that today because the man really is the foundation of the family. And what the enemy's job is, is that if he can remove the male figure from the family, he has begun his process and he's on path to destruction. You look at what's happening. He, I believe he's even using popular culture, using trends in society to fool us into believing the things that we see are the norms and not the way God would have it to be. Biblically and historically, the definition of a marriage has been between a male and a female who God put together to give birth to children. Society is redefining that and saying two people of similar or same sex can end up getting married and adopting children and bringing them into the household. I'm going to stand before you and say, don't fool yourself into thinking that's a cultural norm. That's a trick of the enemy and not the plan of God. Come on, say amen. Don't be afraid to say amen. Come on, don't be, because remember with me, the goal of the enemy is to destroy the family. And the way he destroys the family is by tearing the foundation down. And if he can replace the foundation with something other than God's design, he has gained access and he's messed up what God wants to done. So part of what he does is that he creates these scenarios, these situations, these circumstances to cause the male in the home to go into hiding. And if you can have the male in hiding where they're not available to be used by God, more importantly, where they're not responding to the call of God or the voice of God in their lives, then he begins making traction and he wins and he's doing what God wants done. So today my prayer is that as you hear the message today, that men will come out of hiding because God cares for you. Come on, say amen if you believe that. The passage we're going to look at today is a passage that we've been talking about for quite some time. We started in Genesis chapter 2. We got to chapter 3 where Pastor Katani and I have been talking about. And by way of literary context, what's really going on in chapter 3 
is if you look up at verse 1 until verse 7, what it outlines for us is a scenario where the serpent who is being used by the enemy approaches woman and his approach towards woman is, is that he challenges the very word of God for her life. Did God really say you may not eat or you may eat of any tree in the garden? And she responds, or the mistake she makes is that she engages him in dialogue. And because she engages him in dialogue, the deceit happens, and she ends up falling for the lie of the enemy. She fools herself into believing she can achieve God achieve God likeness because that's what the enemy wants her believe, to believe. She partakes of the fruit. And then the text says in verse 7, she gave it to a husband who was with her. And where the story turns, and the story makes an interesting flip, and we'll talk a lot more about this next week, is the Bible says, around verse 7, that the eyes of both of them were open, and they saw that they were naked. Let's, let's read that together. Look with me at verse 7. Let's read that, and then we're going to pick up and talk about this. Notice what it says here in um, verse 7. It says, the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloth. And then there's a period after that. And if you, depending on your translation, your English translation, there's the beginning of a new paragraph. Now, the reason I want to point all that minute detail out is that what you need to understand about what's happening in the text is that visualize with me, verse 7 happens, and it's almost as if, there is no consequence for their disobedience of God. When you look at it, here's what the text says. They partook of the fruit, their eyes were opened, they saw they were naked, and humanistically speaking, they address the problem of their nakedness by making these loincloths and covering their nakedness, and then the story could almost end there as if there was no consequence for their sin. Okay? Now, we don't know if time elapsed between verse 7 and verse 8. We don't know what the scenario is. But I need to amplify this just for a little while because absent God showing up, it seemed as if the people or Adam and Eve were complacent or comfortable with the solution they provided for their sin. And that's what the enemy will try to fool you and he will try to fool myself into believing is that we can sin with impunity, meaning that there's no consequence for our sins because we fool ourselves into thinking that we can mess up and we can cover it up and go on happy-go-lucky with no consequence. But does anybody in here know God will show up? Oh, come on, say amen if you know. It's, come on, y'all talk to me this morning. Does anybody in here know that God will show up? And, and here's the thing, here's the thing that I want you all to hear me say about verse 7. Absent God, I can fool myself into thinking it's okay. Are you with me? Absent the Holy Spirit, I can fool myself into thinking what I did is sufficient. But I want you all to hear me say this morning, we're not here by ourselves. God is still in control. And this is where the problem comes into the text because here was the temptation and here was the sin. You can be like God. So they fool themselves into believing there is no consequence for what they did. They covered it. They were going on with life and they were happy. But then verse 8 comes to the scene. And look with me at what verse 8 says. And let's read this together and we're going to talk about this. Look at verse 8. I want to read verse 8 to 12. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Look at verse 12. The blame. And the man said, it's Katani's fault. Yeah. <laughs> Look what he said. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree 
and I ate. And we'll pick up the rest of that next week. Now, as we look at this text, as we approach this, here's what I want you all to see what's really happening in the text. The reason they are hiding now in verse 8 is, it, this is going to sound crazy. It's not so much because they sinned, because verse 7 had already happened and told you what happened when they sinned. They covered themselves, right? Verse 8 says, the reason that they went into hiding is because God showed up. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. And, and, and here's where I want to talk to the men, and I really want to be clear about this. When you look with me at verse 1 of chapter 3, all the way from verse 1 up until verse 7, here is what you have. You have the serpent talking, and then the serpent now is engaging the woman in dialogue. The woman partakes of the fruit, and she gives it to her husband who was with her. And between verses 1 and verse 7, the man is silent the whole time. Come on, do you see that in the text? It's, it's the serpent. He engages the woman. The woman partakes in dialogue with the serpent. She partakes of the fruit, and then she takes it, and she gives it to a husband who was with her, and the man is silent the whole time. Now, notice order now. God shows up on the scene, and God ignores the serpent. He ignores the woman, and then he goes directly to the man, and he engages the man in dialogue. I don't want you all to miss that. There's something to be said about that. He ignores the serpent. He ignores the woman. I mean, he addresses them later, but he goes directly to the man and he engages the man in dialogue. Now, the reason I need to amplify that point is because we need to understand before we even go into the message this morning that through the lens of God, from the eyes of God, there is expectation because of who the man is, because of who daddy is, because of who the father is, when God shows up, I want y'all to hear this, he's going directly to the head of the household. Oh, come on, y'all, talk to me this morning. To, to understand or to get a response to what was broke in the house. Does this make sense? He goes past the serpent, he goes past the woman, and he goes directly to the man. When the serpent shows up, knows what he does, he engages the woman, he ignores the man. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. I'm trying to get you to see to me that the enemy, his goal really is the man to get him to fail, but notice the vehicle that he uses. You're important, man. Come on, y'all. If you're sitting next to a man, turn to him and say you're important. Come on, let him know you're important. Now, put the first point on the screen. Let's walk through three simple things I want to share with you. Number one, the enemy is the root cause of men being in hiding, and listen to the term I'm using, from the sound of God. Okay? I find myself in hiding, and I don't understand why I'm hiding, and I'm going to explain that. And I want you to understand, going into the text, the enemy, number one, is the root cause. Does this make sense? Look at the verse. Let's read and let's talk about this. Notice what it says in verse 8. It says here, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Look at verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Men, God are calling you today. Where are you? Come on. He's calling you today. Where are you? Understand the text from an anthropomorphic perspective. Let's, this is what's happening. The author is saying to us that it seems as if every day God would come down and engage the man and his wife in fellowship. And the fact that God would come down and walk with them in the descriptive of the cool of the day, meaning in the breeze of the afternoon when the sun was set, God would come. And his expectation is that when God shows up, the man would come out with his wife and they would engage God in fellowship. Notice how the text flips, right? The enemy comes. He engages woman. Woman feeds the man. God shows up, they hear God, and notice the first thing they do is they go into hiding. Something is broken in the story where the fellowship that what, what was once there has now flipped 
and it's now switched where because of what the enemy did, man fi- found himself in hiding. And I want you to understand this morning, the reason that happens is because the enemy's goal is to get to men. Because if he can get to men, he, think, he fools himself into thinking he is stopping God's plan for the earth. Listen to what man did. I heard God's sound. And when I heard God's sound... I went into hiding. So what's this sound of God? Put the next slide on the screen. Let me just, this is my definition of what the sound of God is. And let's talk through this. God's sound is a conviction from the Holy Spirit we experience reminding us that we are responsible for the protection and care of our households. So let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what that means. Lord. I sense your spirit or your presence in the midst, and I realized that I had blown it. So the conviction from the Holy Spirit, as opposed to me running to God, notice what I did. I backed up. And I went into hiding. Among the trees is a whole other story. I need to make that point because here's what I want you all to understand. You don't have to tell a man he's wrong when he's done something. Oh, come on, women. Come on, come on. You, you don't have to tell him that by virtue of the fact of who he is and who God is. When God shows up, the default state is, I know I messed up. Oh, we're going to talk about that. And so the Holy Spirit does the conviction. The Holy Spirit does the reminding. And because we don't know how to approach God, here's what the man does. He goes into hiding because he's not ready to face God, or he's not equipped, or he's not prepared to face God. So when I hear the sound of God, I look at my current situation, my current circumstance, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and here's what happens. I ended up going into hiding, and believe it or not, the enemy speaks to the woman, the woman gives to the man, because the enemy knows if I can go through the woman to get to the man. Listen to this. When God shows up, man's going to hide. Oh, come on, y'all say amen. Y'all just too quiet. Come on, say amen. I want you to get this, okay? So go to the next slide. Let's talk about the next thing. Let's walk through this real quick. I want to encourage. So here's the deal. The men are hiding in fear from God, from God's sound, because we know that God's holiness exposes our sinfulness. Oh, come on, say amen. Now, now men, I mean, women, let me, let me say this. This is not just men here. Because the same is true for women. God's holiness exposes our sinfulness. So here's the man. I don't want to be exposed because a holy God will see right through. Come on, y'all. Now, now let, me, let me back up to verse 7 because some of y'all still might have missed verse 7. Listen to verse 7. Absent God, their eyes were open, they sewed fig leaves together, and they made loincloths to cover themselves, and they're okay with it as long as God doesn't show up. <laughs> I'm walking around earth. Come on. As long as God doesn't show up, I'm okay with it. But then verse 8, God shows up, and even though I'm covered, I realize my covering is inadequate to stand in the presence of God because, listen to this, where man looks at the outward appearance, God looks where? Yeah, you get it, you get it. So here's what that means, here's what that means. Men now can go out in the world and mess up and do all kinds of craziness and they can come home wearing the covering and she'll never know. Oh, I wish I had somebody. They can go to work and they can mess up and they can go to work all day long and wear the covering and show up and nobody will never know. They might be suspicious and the man can lie all day long because he's fooled you into thinking his covering is inadequate. It's, it's enough to cover him. But he has sense enough to know that when God shows up, uh, come on, y'all say amen, that when God shows up, God can see right through. Oh, come on, talk to me. Right through, and he knows there's no hiding place from God. So the man realizes that when I go into the presence of a holy God, it exposes my sinfulness. Go to the next slide. Let me talk about these two things, then we're going to move along here. So here's that. When sin is present, 
God, God's presence causes us to retreat in fear. Here's what that means. The only reason I'm hiding from God is because I know something is wrong in my life, okay? And, and, and understand the enemy is the cause, so the enemy will do whatever he needs to do to create wrong situations in our lives to get us to hide, right? So if you were to look at the biblical text, if I were to give you some biblical examples, you will notice if you were to walk the Bible, when Abraham was lying, when he was on a journey about Sarah being his wife and he was confront, confronted, notice what he did. In fear, he retreated and he ran. You'll notice when God uh, had Moses in Egypt and Moses killed that Egyptian, notice what the text says. He ran in fear because he had known he had done something wrong. Listen, when, when Jonah was sent to Nineveh and he refused to go to Nineveh and he knew he was wrong, I mean, notice what he did. He retreated in fear. David, when David sinned with Bathsheba and he was confronted and his sin was about to be exposed, notice what he did. He retreated in fear. And I want you to hear me say this morning, the only reason that men find themselves in hiding is because of fear. And here's what we do. We hide in the basements of our lives. Wherever the basement is. For some of us, it's the bar. And we go and we drink ourselves stupid, fooling ourselves into thinking that God isn't there. And he's there the whole time. For some, whatever the sin is, whatever the situation, if it's pornography, whatever the addiction is, whatever it is, whatever that comfortable place is, we go hiding in, the, in that place. And the only reason we're hiding is because we realize that God can expose us. Come on, say amen. So we retreat in fear and we hide from God. Very, very important that we not miss that. Second thing, and then the fear now, it amplifies when our sin is exposed. God comes, Adam, where are you? I heard your sound. I didn't want you to see me. So I go into hiding. I heard you showing up. I didn't want you to see me. So I go into hiding. Now, look at this third thing. Go to the third point. Let's talk about this. We're almost there. Look at the third point. Notice what it says. Man's sinfulness now is a direct result of our disobedience to God's word in our lives. Don't miss this. Leave that up there for a while. Man's sinfulness is a direct result of our disobedience to God's word in our lives. So here's what that means in short, and I'll flesh it out. The only reason that men end up in hiding is because you refuse to obey God's word. We don't obey the word of God and we find ourselves in hiding. The enemy will come, talk to the woman. The woman will address the man. The man finds himself in disobedience. God shows up. Man hears God and guess what he does? In hiding. Understand this. If man had not allowed the enemy to show up to talk to the woman to give to him, there would have been no reason for him to hide. Come on, talk to me this morning, y'all. But the reason we hide is because of disobedience. Now go to the next slide. Let me talk to these things real quick and then I'll be out of the way. just want to share these things. Here's the thing. There's three things that fathers are charged with. There's three things that Adam was charged with. There's three things that men are charged with as it relates to their role and their relationship with God that can reverse this whole process and not give the enemy any victory. Number one, we are charged to exercise dominion. If you were to read Genesis chapter 1, and we talked about this in verse 26 and verse 28, here's what the Lord says. God created man, and then he, in male and female, he created them, and in the verse that he gave them dominion, meaning that Adam had dominion over everything that, ex that existed in the garden. It says in verse 26 and verse 28, over all the living things, over everything that creeps on the face of the earth. And here, here's what that means. There is nothing that exists within the earth realm that can cause man to go into hiding that God did not give him dominion over. 
oh my gosh, you got to get this, you got to get this, you got to get this. Let me just jump straight to, to, to application. Here's what we do. We let a little bottle of alcohol, <laughs> I know nobody here, control us that it takes, takes away the dominion that God has given us and causes us to go into hiding from God when up front God says you have dominion over the thing. Oh, come on, say amen, say amen. We let a little argument, we let sin, we let whatever the temptation is cause us to go into hiding from God when Genesis 1 and 26 says, nothing in the earth realm has dominion over us. And all of a sudden, this booger of a serpent going to show up at Adam's door and cause a scenario to happen that when God visits Adam, Adam is in hiding. And I found it weird that he's in hiding when the whole time he had dominion. Church, there's a lot to be said here about life in America, life in the United States. There's a whole lot to be said about some of the excuses we give for why we are in hiding when my Bible is clear, we have dominion. Oh, Lord Jesus. Yeah, oh, come on, just say amen anyhow. He had dominion. Second thing, man was instructed, secondly, to protect and to serve the garden. Don't miss that, okay? So, so here, here, here's what it says in, in Genesis 2. God planted a garden, and after he planted the garden, there he put the man in the garden. And the reason he put him in the garden was to work it and to keep it. When we spoke about this a few weeks ago, the terms I use was protect and serve. Okay, don't miss this. This is very, very important because this could begin the process of flipping the script for us. So here's what that looks like and here's what that means. If the garden needed to be cleaned, guess who cleaned it? I know the women can talk really loud here that the man did it. <laughs> and the men going to be quiet because we expect her to do it. Oh, come on, y'all talk to me. If the food needed to be cooked, Eve was not yet on the scene, and his job was to dress and keep it. Guess whose responsibility it was to do it? Come on, y'all, talk to me. If, 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 if the floor needed to be swept, if the trees needed to be trimmed, if anything needed to be done, the first thing God did when he created the garden was he placed the man in the garden and he said to him, dress it and keep it. Lock into this. The man every day, if he wanted to eat, guess what he had to do? Get up and go take care. I wish I had somebody in here. It, 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 whatever he needed, he had an obligation to get up and to go into the garden and to do it to make sure it's done. Very, very important that you not miss that. Now, when you look with me, look with me, look with me at verse 7 again. Look with me at verse 7. Verse 7 now, let me paint my picture before I read. The enemy shows up. The enemy speaks to the woman. The woman listens to the enemy. She gives to her man. The man partakes. And then stuff starts to go haywire, right? So look with me at verse 7. Here's what verse 7 says. Let's read it one more time. Notice what it says in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them was open. Now back up to um, verse 6. Verse 6 it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight for the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit, and she ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he did what? And he did what? Come on, he did what? He ate. Okay, don't miss that, don't miss that, don't miss that, don't miss that. Then jump down to verse, verse 12. Look at verse 12, look at verse 12, okay. God shows up, God says, hey, Adam, what's up? Adam, where are you? I'm in hiding. And then look at, look at what verse 12 says. And the man said, when God said, what are you hiding, Adam? Did you eat from the tree? Here's what Adam says. The woman whom you gave to be with me is her fault. I, I like this. This song fresh is coming. It's her fault. Why is it her fault, Adam? Because notice what she did. She gave to me from the tree and I ate. 
Gilbert translation. I liked what she was doing. Let me help you all out. Secondly, man, protect and serve the garden. So anything woman had, this is me, man knew his job as the foundation and he provided for her. Y'all get this? Enemy comes on the scene and the goal of the enemy now is to destroy the family. Don't miss this. He's going to stop at nothing until he gets it done. He goes to the woman. The woman engages him in dialogue. And watch the switch. The woman now takes and gives to the man. Don't miss this. Y'all not, not getting it. Y'all not getting it. Y'all not getting it. Where when God was involved, the man was responsible to provide, the enemy gets involved, and all of a sudden, the woman is carrying the weight of giving, and the man is cool with it. Oh, y'all, y'all. Yeah, y'all, y'all. No, no, no. Let me help you. Here's what that looks like. Adam's in his house. And he has dominion, but he's sitting on the couch, right? He's on the lazy boy. And he's just watching heaven because there's no TV, you know. <laughs> and, and, and then Satan shows up or the enemy shows up in the form of the servant, knocks to the door, and he's engaged in Eve. And look at Adam, no dominion. Hey, Eve, who you talking to? Doesn't engage her. Oh, okay. And he sits back on the couch, Right? And he sits there on the couch and he's enjoying. He does not get up to see who it is. He does not get up to engage. He does not get up to exercise dominion. He just enjoys the couch. Yeah, this is kind of cool sitting here. Then all of a sudden, she comes back from the door and she's bringing something and she says here. And he's like, oh, this is kind of cool. And he still sits on the couch. He never gets up because now she's doing what he should be doing. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. So here's what that looks like. Here's what that looks like. The car note needs to be paid, right? So she gets up and she brings home with a check and she pays the car note and and he's sitting on the couch. Oh, y'all not getting this. The cable needs to be paid, right? She goes to work and she gets a job and she pays the cable, but he's at home sitting on the couch. The mortgage needs to be paid. She goes to work. She pays the bill for the mortgage, but the whole time he's sitting on the couch not doing his job. Role reversal has taken place and that's become the cultural norm. And we've got the foundation out of position. And women now are carrying the weight. I wish I had somebody. Come on, y'all. That's not God's design. And I want you to see how subtle the enemy will come in to disrupt God's design to cause the men to go into hiding. Because we're not doing what God say do. Woman, this is for you. If you find yourself in that situation, stop it. Come on, y'all. Don't, 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 don't excuse the metaphor. No wall should be carrying the weight of a foundation. Yeah. Walls are designed to sit on foundations. Walls are designed to carry the weight of the foundation. Fellas, you want to know why she complains so much when she come home? It's because you being a wall and not a foundation. Get back to being what God has called us to be. Very, very important. Protect and serve. And then the third thing, be the foundation. If the kids need to be cared for, the man should be there to provide for his children. Provide for your sons. Provide for your daughters. Provide for your wives. Be the foundation of the house. That's the father's responsibility. When it's out of order and God shows up, and, and here's the thing. He'll do it all day long if you let him. He'll make it the cultural norm. Heck, he'd be on you going to work today? <laughs> but when God shows up, he hears God's sound. I wish I had somebody in here. And he knows it's wrong. You don't have to tell him because he knows what the foundation is. And lock into what he does, he goes into hiding. It's time to reverse the thing. It's time to come out of hiding and be who God. Come on, say amen, y'all. Come on. It's time to come out of hiding. And be who God would have us to be. So, so look at how, look at how the story ends. Go to the next point, last point, and I'll take my seat. So men, here's the thief. Men hide from God's presence because we are fearful 
of his reaction to the sin in our lives. Here's the reason I hide. Here's the reason you hide. Here's the reason we hide from God. Here's the reason Adam hid is because he had this perception in his head that when God showed up, he was going to have to suffer the consequences for his disobedience. Lock into this. Here's what the word says. The day you partake of this fruit, you will surely die. So if I'm Adam... My wife brings me the fruit, and if I'm Eve and we partake of the fruit, and we look around and we're not dead yet, then all of a sudden we hear God. Here's the first thought coming to my mind. He's showing up to kill us. So guess what I'm going to do? Peace. <laughs> I'm not dying today. That's his mindset. And believe it or not, that's the mindset we have with sin. So you wonder why men aren't coming to church. You wonder why men aren't being involved. Because we have a bad perception of God. We see God as this God that's going to beat us and kill us and punish us and do all this crazy thing to us. But that's the wrong perception of God. Let me help you with this. I have three, I have four grandkids. And my youngest is too young to play this game, but I'm waiting for him to get there. Y'all, you, if you have kids, you've done this with your little kids. Y'all ever played hide and seek with your kids? Don't act like you haven't. Come on, say we have. Here's how it looks like. You say to them, hide and seek, and you stand there, and you say, I'm going to count to ten, and you go hide, and the whole time you're counting like this, right? One, two, three, four, five, and you're counting, and the kids so bless their heart, they're so innocent, they don't know you're peeking, right? They don't know you're looking at them, and, and you count, ready or not, here I come, right? And then here's the funny thing, you go stand exactly where they're hiding, because you saw where they were hiding, and they said, hey, where are you? And the kids are so innocent, they don't know no better, from the hiding place, here's what they say, I'm hiding, best you can't find me. <laughs> And you're standing right there because you knew where they were. When I read this story, I see a very similar situation. Here is an omniscient God, a God that can see everything, a God that knows everything. Come on now. A God that there is no hiding place. Look at what he does. He comes down in the cool of the day. To hang out with them. Adam and Eve goes into hiding. And if you read the story carefully, it's as if God's standing right there. Adam, where are you? And here's dumb Adam. I'm hiding in the trees. <laughs> as if God can't see him. People, that's an important point because it doesn't matter where you hide there's no hiding place from God. Come on, come on, come on. It doesn't matter where you go. There is no hiding place from God. David said it this way in Psalms 139. Where can I go to flee from your presence? If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings and ascend to the heaven, even there you shall find me. There is no hiding place from God. And a lot of us fool ourselves to thinking in our sin, we're hiding from God. Don't make that mistake. He's right there. And here's the beauty of the story. Where Adam thought God was going to show up to kill him. Instead, God showed up to show him grace. Come on. God showed up to show him love. Come on. God showed up to show him compassion. And I want to make this point. Man, we need to come out from hiding because God's not after you to kill you. God is after you to love you. God is after you to care about you. Come on. God is after you to put his arms around you. God is after you to forgive you, to bring us back into a right relationship with him. And we miss that. So come out of your hiding. The family needs you. God needs you. The church needs you. Your community needs you. Your children need you. Come on. Your grandchildren need you. Quit allowing the enemy to come into your house and talk to your spouse and put us out of position. God needs us. Stop hiding because God cares. 
And we need to learn how to flip that. So on this Father's Day, my prayer for fathers, my prayer for men is that we can step up to the plate. I was sharing with first service. You look on the platform on, on this Father's Day, and man, the women have stepped up like it's nobody's business. Heck, they even gave us beer this morning. That was first service only, amen. Yeah, I'm just joking, I'm joking. Beautiful breakfast. They invested time. They came out to sing. They serve. You look at the, the church is filled with women. Hear me. It's not that the enemy isn't after the women, but he will do whatever and use whatever he needs to do as long as he can keep the men away. Men, you're the foundation of the family. You're the foundation of this world. You're the safety. You're the security. You're the thing that God needs to have this world where it needs to be. We need to come out of hiding. We need to quit letting our wives and our spouses outserve us. We need to lead from the front, not from the rear. And whenever we find ourselves leading from the rear, here's what the enemy says. Oh, I've got that. And it's not like we don't know what's wrong because when we hear the sound of God, guess what we do? Go into hiding because we think God's going to get us. Let's revert, reverse that process today. Come on, can we do that this morning? Let, come on, y'all. Let's, let's reverse. Let's reverse. Let's reverse. Let's reverse this process. This church ought to be filled with men. This platform ought to be filled with men. Men ought to be taking their rightful place. And here's the sad thing, and I don't want to offend nobody, but here's the sad commentary about this. In the Christian church, the men are hiding. In the non-Christian church, in those non-Christian cults, you see men out front all day long, and we fool ourselves into thinking that that's right because men are leading. No, 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 no. If the enemy can put you in a cult where you don't hear about God all day long, But in his church, in his church, in his church, we ought to stand to the occasion. Come on, men, all over this place, stand to your feet. Come on, stand to your feet. Men all over this building. All over this building, come on, stand. Regardless of your age, come on, stand. Amen. Come on, men, that's not you, Kathy, nor Stephanie. Amen, just men. Amen. Come, I want to invite you all. Come line this altar. Come, we're just going to pray. Come on. Come on, fellas. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Line the altar. Line the altar. Men all over this building, line this altar. Line this altar. Line this altar. Look at this church. Come on, women. We ought to be clapping. Come on. We ought to be clapping. We ought to be clapping. Look at all these men. Look at, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Look at all these men. 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 Foundation, strength, pillar, design of God for leadership. Don't have no enemy cause you to go into hiding. Stand firm and be who God would have you to be. Come on, ladies, I need you to stand wherever you are. And I need you to point your hand this way over these men. And we're going to pray over them. That they would be the man God has called them to be from this day forward. No more hiding. No more hiding. First service, our women said they're prepared to defer to the men because they want men to lead. In the church of God, we need to take our rightful place. Understand that the enemy is after you. You got to hear me say that he's after you. And we can't let him gain access. We cannot allow that to happen. So come on, we're going to pray. Father, I thank you for every man that's at this altar. What blesses my heart, God, it's almost as if the men outnumber the women. And that's a beautiful picture to see. Beautiful picture to see, God. So I bless every man that's standing at this altar. They're pillars, God. They're priests. They're royal priesthood. Heads of household, God. We anoint them afresh. We cover them on this father. These are the fathers to our sons and daughters. This is tomorrow's legacy, God. Satan, we're serving you. Notice you have no presence in the life of none of these men at the altar. Strongholds are broken. Addictions are released. Whatever trick the enemy may have been trying, be it through women, be it through alcohol, be it through television, it ceases as of today in the name of Jesus. We speak life over their families. 
We speak victory over them. There's callings. There's anointings right here, God. You're going to bless them, God. So, God, as a church, we cover them that they rise to the occasion and be the men that you've called them to be. So we honor them on this Father's Day. But then again, we place them in their rightful position as the forerunners, as the leaders, as the protection, as the people who have dominion, those that are called to protect and serve as the foundation, not only of this church, but the community, not only of their homes, but this nation. And we're not discounting the importance of women. We're not doing that. But we're recognizing your order, God. So we bless them. And you're calling them by name. Adam! Where are you? And we hear them saying, here I am, Lord. No more hiding. Here I am, Lord. No more running. Here I am, Lord. No more secrecy. Here I am, Lord. We hear them saying, I'm coming out from hiding, God. Here I am. So God, bless them. Bless them like you've never blessed them before, God. Those that are looking for jobs, give them jobs like you've never done it before, God. Reverse their finances, God. Bless them, Lord, as only you can do it. Ah, we give them to you, God. And we stand with them, Lord, that you use them for your purpose. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. No man at this altar you have access to anymore. In your name we pray and thank you, God. Amen. Come on, give God a hand for it. Y'all hug each other, man. Hug each other. Give. Thank you, man. Thank you.